Today, we're going to ask the question, is Alareza Perugia the next Paul Morphy? It's an interesting question, and I think he just might be. The game we're going to go over today, and his opponent is Nijat Abasov, who's rated around 2650 feet, a, a very highly rated opponent. And it's shocking how quickly Alareza gets a huge lead in development. For me, that's the hallmark of Paul Morphy. Game after game, he would get a massive lead in development, even against strong competition. Well, look at the kind of development Alareza Perugia gets in this game against a very strong grandmaster. Alareza Perugia has the white pieces. Uh, Najat Abbasov has the black pieces. And let's begin. Uh, Alareza plays e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6. The Petrov defense. Of course, we know the Petrov defense is an attempt by black to equalize first and then try to slowly outplay the opponent. They're not trying to win with black right out of the opening when they play the Petrov. d4, knight e4. Alareza plays d e5. The most commonly played move here by like a factor of 10 is actually bishop to d3. Uh, so he plays a little bit lesser known move. d e5. His opponent, play, opponent plays d5. Supporting that knight on e4, if Alarezzo were to say take it en passant, then after bishop takes d6, and black is fine. So instead, Alarezzo plays knight b to d2. To challenge that knight at e4, I mean the knight on e4 is protected, but to just sort of put some pressure on that knight at e4. Uh, bishop to e7. Uh, perhaps knight takes d2 would be a better choice. Queen takes d2. Maybe a better choice for black. He plays bishop to e7, and um, this move doesn't really score that well. But it looks like Alarez's opponent is hoping here that uh, he, white will capture the knight on e4, get queens off the board, and maybe reduce some of Alarez's sharp tactical ability. Well, uh, he gets his wish for trading queens. He doesn't get his wish when it comes to containing Alarez's tactical skill. Uh, Ferrugia does go ahead and take on e4, pawn takes, queen d8, bishop d8, and then knight to d4, the knight was attacked. So queens are off the board, and you're saying, well, this doesn't look like a Paul Morphy game yet. Watch how quickly, from this position, Alareza Ferrugia gets a massive lead in development. I mean, it's almost mystical how it happens. You, you can watch him do it and still not even know. It, it's, it's unbelievable. Okay, so his opponent plays knight to d7. He plays bishop to f4, defending the pawn. Knight to c5. Well, that's two moves in a row with a knight. So Alareza castles queenside. Puts the rook at d1 on uh, the open file. It's the king to safety. c6 is played, trying to start a pawn storm on the queen side against Alareza's king, but it's another move without a piece being moved, right? Alareza says, okay, bishop c4. Now look, already he has both bishops, knight and rook, all developed and he's castled. His opponent has one piece developed and he's not castled. So we already see a huge gap in development. Now, you could put this position into a computer and it will say white has about half a pawn, maybe a little bit more of an advantage. You know, it, it sees things like, well, black doesn't really have any weaknesses, and so black can get away with this kind of play. But let me ask you this, just as a, just a question. Do you really think that you can give Alareza Ferrugia a lead in development like that and expect to survive, no matter what the computers have to say? Really? Highly unlikely. Let's watch how uh, the Grandmaster uses his lead in development to win this game. The bishop goes to e7, rook h to e1. Now every piece is developed. a5 wants to keep white from playing b4, maybe and ejecting the knight from c5, but also pawn storming the white king. h3, Alareza says, well, I'll gain some space myself on the king side and keep a piece off of the g4 square. h5, controlling that square, keeps white from playing g4, because then black would just take it and then give his own rook at h8 the open h-file. a3, beginning to press, bishop to d7, king to b1, b5, bishop to a2. Now, I will admit, up to this point, black has played pretty well. Um, black is not losing. But again, 
it's one of those situations where you're fine now, but if you make one mistake, you're in huge trouble, even if the mistake is a natural move. Well, Black plays a natural move here, and it's a big mistake. The best moves for Black might be h4 to kind of clamp down on that space on the king's side, or b4 to continue to gain space on the queen's side. Black plays a natural move, castling. But now Black's king is in big trouble, even with queens off of the board. See, that bishop at a2 is really powerful. It pins that f7 pawn, aims right at Black's king now. And uh, Ferruja can open up lines on the king side, even sacrificing a pawn. Because he can get those rooks on the h and the g file, go right after that king. And that's what he does immediately. He plays g4. Um, if pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, bishop takes, then the pawn at c6 would hang. Uh, but that's exactly what he does. Again, perhaps a move like b4 would have been the best. But he goes ahead and takes. Takes. Now, the pawn on g4 is too dangerous to grab. Um, and, but black is already in huge trouble. Black actually does go ahead and take that pawn. Maybe, you know, it's something psychological. You say, well, queens are off the board, so I'm not in that much danger. But even with queens off, black is in huge danger. A better approach might have been rook a to c8. The problem is, now he got the open h file. When black castled, his rook was no longer on the h file, so now white can take it. After, say, bishop takes rook d to g1, look at all these pieces. The bishop at a2 puts pressure. The two rooks on the g and h file, it would be curtains. It would be over. He could play rook f to d8, perhaps then bishop to e3, b4, and rook h1, and then just rook h2 and bring the d rook over to h1, doubling on that file, and that would be too much, and computers can tell you white's just uh, winning in this position. But he goes ahead, he takes the pawn on g4, Ferruja takes on c6, uh, because he can always play knight takes bishop at e7 check. In fact, in this case, it will be a terrible blunder for black to take the rook at d1, because watch what happens. Knight takes bishop check, king h7, then rook h1 check. And you can block it once, boom, mate. So it's not just getting the two bishops for a rook, it's actually checkmate if uh, black takes the rook on d1. So instead he plays rook f to e8 to defend the bishop at e7, rook to d5, applying pressure to the knight at c5, but also now getting the rook out of the threat from the g4 bishop. Now it would hang. Rook a to c8, attacking the knight at c6, and indirectly defending the knight at c5. But now, white is able to create double attacks. Knight to a7, attacking the rook at c8 and the pawn at b5. Uh, if he plays, say, rook to b8 to defend that pawn, then bishop e3 hits the knight at c5. And if the knight, say, moves to e6, then knight takes b5. The rook at d5 would defend. And if he plays more aggressively with knight e4, then just bishop to d4 defends b2. And after, say, bishop to e6, rook takes b5, and he still gets the pawn, and he would still be winning. So after knight a7, black plays rook to a8, knight takes b5. One pawn, and that's all Ferruja will need. Rook e to b8. It looks like black is piling on the queen side, but he can defend. Ferruja can defend, no problem. Knight c7 hits the rook at a7. Rook a7 and now e6. The bishop at f4 now defends that knight at c7, with also some x-ray pressure on the rook at b8. Rook a to b7, threatening the pawn at b2. First, Ferruja plays ef7 check. That's a forcing move, so he can't take the pawn at b2. He has to address his king being in check. He plays king to f8. Now, if he tries to take the pawn, then something simple like rook to c5, discovered check. And the bishop at a2 would then be checking the king, and he would just get the piece for free. So, black plays king to f8. First off, bishop to e5. That defends the b2 pawn from the two rooks. Puts some pressure on the g7 pawn. Knight to d7. If instead he plays, say, knight to e6, the knight takes check, bishop e6, and rook to a5, and it's way too many pawns. He's got those three connected passers on the queen side. It would be a, a very easy endgame win. So instead, knight to d7, put some pressure on the e5 bishop. Rook takes d7, an exchange sacrifice, giving up a rook for a knight. 
The bishop takes d7, rook to h1, game over. Already, black resigned in this position. Why? Well, let's take a look. If black plays, say, bishop to d8, then just rook check, king to e7, and you just promote to a queen and its mate on the spot. So let's say instead of bishop to d8, something like bishop to c5. That way the bishop can stay in contact with the f8 square. Rook to h8 check, king to e7, knight to d5 check, king to e6, then bishop takes rook at b8. It's an entire piece. Well, what about bishop takes a3? I mean, the pawn at b2 is pinned after all. That's a, a more aggressive way to handle it. Well, watch this. Rook h8 check, king to e7, knight to d5 check, King takes f7, knight to f4. That's a check because the bishop at a2 is now unveiled against the king. And if he blocks, if bishop to e6, bishop e6 check, king e7, rook to b8, wins far too much material. And if instead of bishop to e6, he plays king to e7, then very simply, knight, g6, mate. It's very simple. Doesn't matter what the computers say. You can't give a huge lead in development like that to a player like Alareza. Is he the next Paul Morphy? Tell me what you think down in the comments section. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.